to say that uh, my name is Harry O'Neill. I am Assistant Director here at the British School at Rome and we're so pleased that you could join us for our virtual BSR which is um, really a response to um, bringing all of our activity online during coronavirus. Um, it's a pleasure that you could all join us tonight and it's a pleasure to, that our discussants could join us tonight as well. It's um, a very different type of event for the BSR. Um, it's more emotional, I think, and indeed personal, which means that um, I'm really, really very, very grateful that, that our discussants will come on, prepared to come on and share in something that is, is so personal. So it gives me great pleasure to thank Zoe um, Papadopoulou, Simona Corso, if you wave, then we know who, so we've got Simona there. Um, we've got Sandra Moog from Essex, she can wave as well. Floria Muskinu is there, and um, Arati Prasad from UCL as well. So thank you very much. Um, and we also owe our thanks to Bean Human Festival and the UCL Cities Programme. As many listeners will know, the Bean Human is led by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and also the British Academy, both of whom the BSR work with um, very closely. It's an international festival and that gives me great pride because three of our speakers are in fact in Rome, which promotes public engagement with humanities research, specifically highlighting the ways in which the humanities can inspire and enrich our everyday lives, help us to understand ourselves, our relationships with others and the challenges we face in a changing world. And um, I really think this conversation is going to do that tonight, um, even though the subject matter is very difficult. Uh, the theme this year is New Worlds, and we're delighted to say that it's the BSR's fourth collaboration with the Bean Human Festival, and something I very much hope will continue. I'm going to pass over to Florian now, who can say something about the UCL cities, and then we'll return to the theme more generally before I hand over to Zoe for the, for the main part of the presentation. So thank you very much to discussants, and thank you very much to audience. Thank you, Harriet, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight and uh, to co-host this. Um, as Harriet ex explained, the event is jointly organized by the BSR, the Being Human Festival, and the UCL Cities Partnerships Program in Rome. And I take the opportunity to just say a few words about the strong links um, between the British School of Rome and the uh, UCL Cities program um, since uh, we're now moving into the fourth year of activity together and the BSR has been consistently a very dynamic and uh, very um, enthusiastic partner and a, and a loyal friend. Um, the idea for the uh, Cities Partnerships program was actually born at a conference in the BSR in Rome in 2017 um, after the uh, Brexit uh, Europe referendum, uh, where we wanted to sort of find new ways of championing mobility, collaboration, right across academic disciplines with international partners, but not only with academic institutions, also with uh, the cultural sector, um, with artists uh, like Zoe, who is going to share her work with us today, with museums, with collections. And um, already in 2018, we had a pilot scheme uh, which uh, supported 11 collaborative projects with uh, partners in Rome. Um, BSR, first and foremost, Roma 3, La Sapienza, Luis, um, the Museum of Rome in Palazzo Braschi. And uh, there was in total uh, more than 30 events um, in that year, um, all taking place between April and June, and more than 100 speakers. And this included the first event um, uh, at which I actually had the pleasure of, of meeting Zoe and, and working for the first time as part of this team with um, my friend and, and UCL colleague Arati Prasad, with, with Zoe, who had previously worked with, with Arati and with Simona um, from uh, Roma 3. And um, since then, we had um, three further events, um, um, all exploring the, the synergies between our very different disciplinary backgrounds and our common interests. So, um, and Sandra also has joined the team now, uh, contributing with her own, with her own expertise. Um, we take this common shared theme of, of mourning as an opportunity to reflect both on 
the importance of of cultural practice, cultural narratives, um, uh, as a way of sort of rethinking existential dilemmas, and as a way of highlighting um, the the importance of of, 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 of multiple artistic and, and and personal languages. But we also very much want to to really um, uh, foreground the the range of, of perspectives in this, from as 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 our title today suggests, from um, from from individual experiences of loss, uh, which are obviously um, the most central um, reference point for all our discussions, to anxieties about the loss of what we call home, forced displacement, uncertainty about the future. I won't say any more, um, uh, and I'll. Um, I look forward to listening to, to Zoe with, with great pleasure, uh, but I, I take the opportunity to thank you all again for being here and, and thank you um, uh, to the uh, BSR and to Harriet O'Neill for suggesting this event. Oh, well, thank you, Florian. Um, so really, before handing over to Zoe, I just wanted to say that um, clearly <laughs> the, the, new, the, uh, the festival theme is New Worlds. And as um, Florian indicated, this uh, event is really going to think about how we mourn for old ones and as he said this can be personal loss of a friend of the relative that might seem like our whole world collapses or experienced on a larger collective level um, and as Florian said about changing environments or political situations and I think coronavirus has really focused our attention on grief not simply in terms of loss of life but how it transforms the way we live and in many senses um, forcing us to leave behind an old world and that's also um, rather like Brexit and the language that people adopt is sometimes um, connects to, to grieving and mourning. Uh, this conversation aims to think about how we grieve, how we have grieved, what we grieve for and how we record the mourning period. It will address individual and collective grief and its temporal qualities in terms of beginnings and endings and we realise this is difficult material so you're welcome to just listen but if you want to get in more engaged you can use the Q&A function. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Zoe, who is absolutely central to um, our conversation tonight, as is her welcome um, funded work, uh, Grief, a Work in Progress, um, a performance video and publication in uh, collaboration with Dr. Kirsten Smith from the University of Oxford, Deborah Coolan, founding director of the all-female uh, performance company Gaggle, and Dr. Caitlin Hitchcock from the Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at the University of Cambridge. To say Zoe is a UK based artist who did her BAA in Fine Art at Middlesex and then went on to do a Master's in Design Interactions at the Royal College of Art. She says her practice is prim primarily concerned with the politics and implications of new technologies and she collaborates with scientists and ethicists to probe discussions on the impact they will have on public groups. So for us in the BSR there's a really nice connection with Fiona Crisp's talk last week if you saw it and it will be available um, in recorded form soon. So I'm going to switch off my microphone <laughs> and um, we're all going to switch off our videos, actually, because the sounds, there's a sound element to Zoe's work. So um, thank you very much for being here and, and thank you especially to Zoe. Uh, hello, thank you very much, Harriet. Thanks for uh, having me uh, today. And hello, everyone uh, that's out there. Um, OK, so uh, you've heard the name, so I'll tell you a little bit about what each one of these collaborators briefly um, uh, is doing. So I'll start with uh, Simona Corso, who is Associate Professor of English uh, Literature at Roma Tre, uh, University of Rome. Her research interests cover the tradition of the European novel and the novel in English from the 18th century to the present. Recently, she has been working on the way literature can articulate the experience of mourning and on the kinds of solace it can offer. Uh, then uh, Sandra Moak, who is a lecturer in Management and Sustainability at uh, University of Essex. Uh, she is the author of a number of books and articles on international environmental politics and transnational civic activism on the comparative basis of environmental movement organization in Europe, North America and South America, and on the role of NGOs and corporations in process of environmental governance. Uh, Florian Musnak is Professor of Comparative Literature and Italian Studies at UCL and 
works on radical artistic practice, the post-human and on cultural representations of catastrophe and apocalypse. And finally, Arati Prasad, who is a senior research fellow at the Institute for Global Health at University College London, where her work focuses on the impacts of environmental sustainability on people's health in informal settlements in uh, Kenya. And she does some really interesting things in her spare time, like studying human remains at archaeological excavations, most recently at the dark side of Vesuvius, uh, an ancient infant cemetery on a Greek island, and a necropolis in Rome. Uh, prior to UCL, she was science advisory at the British Council and policy at the House of Commons. So uh, thanks for joining us. I'll now present a brief a work in progress. And in the, oh, sorry. In the first uh, part of the presentation, I'll talk about how the project began, followed by a 20 minute documentation of a performance piece. And in, then finish off with a bit more about the future of the project. So um, over the past few years, together with scientists, psychologists and the bereaved, I have been collecting and archiving individual stories of loss in the 21st century in order to create a collaborate, collaborative interventions in the form of performances and public events uh, with those affected. The project began, began as a kind of inquiry into my own bereavement and individual loss and has expanded into new areas in the past two years as I have begun to develop ways to address new forms of collective loss that are becoming so prominent for us at the moment. Uh, on the, so on the 5th of November in 2015, at the Royal Free Hospital in London, my partner of 20 years died of high grade small cell neuroendocrine cancer. Um, we had never heard of this cancer before her diagnosis uh, a year before she died. And despite the very precise prognosis and the ups and downs of the treatments, uh, I was still blindsided in the end. I, I hadn't known grief like this before and didn't feel like leaving the house much after that. But what I did do is spend a lot of time uh, reading. Uh, I was interested in cultural responses to death through literature and uh, visual arts in the way that uh, in the ways writers and artists had found to deal with their own grief. Um, my kind of main initial reaction was I need to research my grief to try and make sense of how I was thinking and feeling at the time. Uh, I began reading about the physiological and cognitive effects of grief. I was really surprised at the extent of our physical responses, the changes in our hormone levels, shifts in metabolism, even changes in the chemical makeup of our blood as grief makes blood stick here during the process of mourning. Um, also, the heart's response to grief is pretty shocking. It, it weakens and often balloons into the shape of a Takotsubo, which is a traditional Japanese trap for fishing octopi. Um, this is more commonly known as the broken heart syndrome or a Takotsubo cardiomyopathy and is um, most acute in the month following a significant loss. Um, in a, a really beautiful project uh, called Topography of Tears, Rosalind Fisher photographed this these tears in, in the images you see, during a period of personal loss, she found that tears in each of these categories include distinct molecules and look completely different. Emotional tears were, have been found to contain the neurotransmitter leucine encephalin, a natural painkiller that is released when the body is under stress. And also technological advances in functional magnetic resonance imaging have enabled psychologists to carry out new kinds of research on the effects grief can have on different networks of the brain. Uh, for example, in a study at Harvard uh, University on cognitive biases in grief, they were able to examine participants' ability to recollect specific events from their past, as well as their ability to imagine scenarios from their future, since the same brain network controls both memory and imagination. Uh, the study showed that a cognitive, cognitive deficit was apparent only when the events 
didn't include the deceased. Participants were unable to recall specific moments from their past that didn't involve their lost loved ones, but were also unable to express future scenarios without them. Um, uh, and one other study also showed that when brief participants looked at photographs of the disease, the area of the brain associated with addiction and reward would activate during the scans. So in uh, 2016, I too participated in a study on autobiographical memory and bereavement conducted by uh, Dr. Kirsten Smith of Oxford University. She was investigating the psychological processes involved in adaptation following bereavement. Uh, Kirsten would eventually become, um, as Harriet mentioned earlier, one of my collaborators for Grief and Work in Progress. Um, but the main catalyst for the project was my experience of bereavement group therapy. Um, I guess when I did go to group therapy uh, sessions, I was looking for a space where I could not only talk about some of the thoughts I was having at the time, but also engage in conversations about grief in literature, in art and in science. Um, but instead, I mainly heard this. Um, which is okay, but um, not so helpful in some ways. In the way it was really helpful to me and the project though, is that it made me wonder if there was another way to bring bereaved people together in a way that would encourage them and give them more confidence in remembering their individual stories of, of loss. Um, so using the research that I had already done and my own story, I devised a series of workshops, especially for bereaved participants. The participants all had to commit to the whole series, which consisted of six two-hour sessions uh, and were all centered around one main activity, which would enable open expression and a more social connection within the group itself. The format was simple. We would begin by talking about literally and uh, artistic responses to grief. Um, and uh, I felt it was important for all of us to kind of acquire new skills and engage in new experiences from each other. And, and then we would begin one of the activities followed by a kind of show and tell, uh, sharing our work and our stories. So it was kind of a bit like going to art school in many ways. Um, so for one of these activities, the participants were asked to write down and read their memories of their past selves and their memories of their lost loved one. So uh, the activity was based on John Brainerd's autobiography uh, called I Remember, where he begins every memory and stray thought with the words I remember. Uh, what the participants didn't know at the time until the, I think, uh, the end of the second workshop was that I would ask them to perform some of these texts in a performance piece at the South Bank Center. So after the six original workshops were completed, we began collaboratively developing and then rehearsing and preparing for the public performance. Uh, the performance was structured chronologically from terminal diagnosis to death and its aftermath. And it concluded with the participants one by one reciting each other's texts as they exited the stage. So uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, much more about the performance. I'm going to play the video, if that's okay. Uh, and then continue with the uh, final part of the talk. The video is just under uh, 20 minutes or so, so that you know. And so here we go and
I'm the consultant doctor. How are you? Not great. Who are you? Her partner. Malignant. Cancer. Have a seat. High grade, small cell, neuroendocrine cancer. Skin cancer. Lung cancer. Advanced cancer. 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 Aggressive. Metastatic. Skin cancer. Terminal. Chemotherapy. Palliative. Any questions? How long? Two years, maybe. Thank you. Goodbye. Soaking. So this is how my introduction to anticipatory grief happens. In wet trousers, soaking in the urine I can't hold on to. Overtaken by extreme fear, my nervous system is in a state referred to as fight or flight. My limbic system rushes that much energy into my heart, muscles and lungs that it shuts down the more trivial areas. My brain decides that keeping urine in my bladder is not as important as fighting or flighting. I stand up and form a fist. Then I look at you, distraught, but calm. which could be disruptive to the rest of the world. The consultant oncologist, the four junior doctors, the consultant radiologist, the palliative care nurse, the two physiotherapists, the, pa the palliative consultant, the chaplain, the priest, the specialist nurse, the ward sister, the ward housekeeper, and the all duty nurses are all frequent visitors. The heavily pregnant nurse brings some banana loaf. I forget how much I hate Walter and ask if she knows the sex of her unborn child. A girl, we're going to call her Sophia. Greek for wisdom, I say. She seems delighted with her choice, but can't decide on a middle name. You see, it has to be a type of pasta. Are you religious? She asks. Well, if I was, I'm not anymore. My husband and I are pastafarians, hence the choice of pasta. Pastafarians. I'm not sure if this is Canadian humor or if she's trying to cheer me up. It's about promoting a lighthearted view of religion. So what types of pasta do you like the sound of, she asks.
get up, call the nurse, ask for morphine. 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 I'm taken to the storage room by a junior doctor. Surely there's something stronger. Bidazola. But now I have to decide for you. She needs my consent. It's like an aesthetic. But no, she won't wake up. You have two hours. Two hours to become the accomplice. She never says palliative sedation. The end is not what I imagined. I expect myself to collapse as my oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine levels crash to a 20 year low. I lean forward and look at the floor. Left foot, right foot, flat, rigid. I'm still on my feet. But next to me, another version of myself the one worthy of my Greek heritage, on my knees, wailing, weeping, beating my chest. 
this is what my brain thinks I should be doing, but adrenaline and cortisol are keeping me upright. This time, I don't want to fight or flight. We leave you alone. Take as much time as you need. The nurse leaves the side room. I stare at you with a single thought on repeat. Is this it? The nurse comes back to tell me the porter is on his way to collect you. I don't want to see them take you. I go for a cigarette instead. I come back to find your bed has gone. My carpet is unmade, folded, and sit in the middle of the room. I guess this means I have to go now. I want to stay here one last night. It's 2 a.m. This is it. I am now sitting in a fucking bereavement group, comparing my grief to that of others. At least her husband lived until he was 68. That's 20 years longer. But then a late camera walks in. My husband died when I was pregnant. I decide to pursue more elaborate ways to add weight to my grief. I record my blood pressure, sleeping patterns, new aches and pains. Time spent thinking about you, or what clinical psychologists call yearning. I wait for the stress-induced cardiomyopathy, also known as broken heart syndrome, to arrive. I even keep an hourly record of the number of steps I take through my iPhone. Not that many. I never go out.
I remember your tender kiss on my forehead, making the sign of the cross every time you took a stroll from beneath your properties, writing poems on the kitchen table with a tiny pencil. the smell of your pencil drawer at home, the reassuring feeling that I must have gone mad after you died, feeling angry on Father's Day, being scared I would remember everything. I remember everything, your long blonde eyelashes and red curly hair, when you asked if you could move in with me, the doctor saying there was nothing more they could do. I remember how one day I forgot about my newfound hate for sunny days. I'm sitting outside and it's a sunny day. It's a nice day. I noticed someone cycling, no helmet, just a cool pair of shades. Thank <laughs> you. 
So sorry about this, just one sec. Uh, yeah, here I am again. Oops. Ah. So, um, can you hear me by the way? Yeah, I think you can. Um, so the um, feedback from the participants was quite overwhelming. Um, I was lucky enough to have Dr. Sean McPhee from King's College in the audience, who went on to write her master's thesis on the project. Um, and these were some of the quotes from interviews she did with, with the performance participants a few, a few months later. Um, and uh, her assessment of the various dimensions that came together in the performance uh, were really useful and interesting. Um, she highlighted four key aspects, the uh, affective, physiological, cognitive, and the, and the social. And following on from the success of the performance, uh, I decided to run more workshops, but it was you know, naturally impossible to keep performing uh, my partner's death over and over. So uh, the project had to take a new kind of uh, form, which is, um, which is now this. It's a 1973 Fiat uh, ambulance, which I converted into a mobile workshopping space and kind of traveling archive of individual uh, testimonies of loss, I guess. Uh, it's designed to host up to four participants and contains a small library, uh, music collection, uh, scientific papers, objects, and of course, material from previous uh, workshops, uh, other people's stories, basically. Um, and there's also a, a couple of speakers on, on top now, which we can broadcast uh, talks and events from inside the van. Um, so I then began taking the van uh, on the road to hospices and hospitals uh, in the summer of 2019 to begin running workshops for uh, healthcare workers and junior doctors addressing issues of uh, palliative care, uh, bereavement and how um, medical diagnoses are communicated with carers and how those can affect the way carers grieve uh, in the future. So uh, one key uh, challenge uh, has been to figure out how to incorporate some of the ele elements of the original project into smaller workshops in the van, and in particular the kinesthetic and fully collaborative um, elements. So um, as, I, and as I, expand, I started to expand the project, at the time, uh, I remember XR were demonstrating against uh, mass, uh, mass extinction, uh, bringing together thousands of people uh, mourning a changing planet. And at the same time, also Brexit was becoming a, a reality. So dividing the public uh, and creating a sense of isolation and political disenfranchisement for many of us. So I started noticing many people around me expressing feelings of fear, of anger and sadness, which kind of sounded a lot like grief. Um, uh, so uh, grief in the face of ecological loss, grief about the undoing of democracy and political community made me think about the way I approached my own anticipatory grief and subsequent loss through the workshops and the development of the performance. I've just shown, uh, I began to think about how a new set of interventions could be developed to begin to address these other losses and grief and our individual and collective uh, response to them. Uh, I started working with Arati and Florian from UCL as well as uh, Sandra and Simona um, in order to develop another series of workshops and performance around uh, climate grief. Uh, by the beginning of the year, we had planned workshops with teenagers addressing climate grief and a conference on affect, affecting the age of laws, both to take place at UCL in the spring of 2020. Uh, we were also developing a series of workshops with artists and graduate students in the humanities 
uh, at the British School at Rome, which was supposed to take place at the GeoStories, uh, GeoVisions Summer School in Rome uh, in September, uh, I think this year. And then uh, COVID hit. Um, so then the multiple overlapping forms of collective grief I had begun to explore were suddenly radically compounded. The pandemic poses new challenges for the expression of individual grief and new losses, uh, with millions of people have not only experienced the unexpected loss of a loved one, but also being prevented from taking comfort in the most basic forms of emotional support and uh, expression. Um, there have been so many stories, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, of people FaceTiming their loved ones goodbye, uh, prevented by the social distancing rules from attending uh, their loved one's deathbed and even funeral. And as the death toll has begun to mount, traditional rituals of memorial and support have been almost rendered impossible uh, or illegal even, uh, gathering for a funeral, uh, dropping by with food, seeking comfort in uh, the embrace of our next of kin. Uh, worse yet, for many of the bereaved, these challenges have been made even more difficult by secondary losses, uh, loss of employment, the loss of a career or a whole industry. At the moment, these are the individual stories I've been gathering and working with. So, um, as a society, we're confronting, confronting a series of collective losses, the loss of a sense of safety, of social connections and personal freedoms, of jobs, financial security, and we're facing a series of, of specific injuries, almost as we begin to lose sports, like music, dancing, weddings. Um, going forward, we anticipate that we will experience new losses we can't yet predict. Uh, but what's interesting is that both our sense of anxiety in the face of climate change and ecosystem loss and the myriad uh, losses arising from the pandemic are not only causing individual and collective grief, but new forms of anticipatory grief and to a great extent a kind of disenfranchised grief because we haven't yet discovered ways of comprehending or marking or recognizing, expressing these losses and emotions as a society. So while the van's been uh, kind of grounded for now, I began looking for ways to begin uh, creating spaces for expression and exploration of this grief. So like uh, almost every other thing, like this talk today, grief uh, a work in progress moved online uh, in recent months with a new website called uh, I Remember uh, and has begun gathering uh, memories and reflections on loss, archiving personal narratives of bereavement, um, eco-anxiety, oops, sorry. Uh, this should be play. There we go. Um, and uh, COVID-related uh, loss. So, while waiting for the days where public events can uh, and face-to-face -face workshops can uh, start again, I've been working with my collaborators to find ways to uh, once again bring that more kinesthetic and collaborative elements that were integral to the success of the performance at the South Bank into the work. So uh, uh, I began to conduct a series of interviews about COVID losses, inviting individuals to contribute to the rolling collective uh, narrative of loss on, on the I Remember side. And it would be great if uh, some of you were interested or would like to leave something on it. It's the website I remember.co and contribute to the archive of testimonials to loss in the 21st century there. And also to please do get in touch if you want uh, to arrange a workshop online or offline. I've been visiting people one-to-one -one in the van. So if you're not way too far away, I'd be more than happy to come to you. So um, yeah, that's it from me, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>